Thank you, Madame la Ministre, for this uh, brilliant presentation of the challenges ahead. I will now turn to the speakers of this uh, roundtable with no delay. Uh, you just uh, mentioned uh, the, um, the task force of the, um, on the climate finance disclosure, and um, we have here Christian Timan, the, the co-chair of this task force. Uh, Christian, could you tell us more about the recommendations of uh, this task force, please? Yes, very much. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank uh, Europlas for the invitation, and I would like to congratulate once more, and I think I will do it every time I see Ségolène Royal again for the Paris Agreement. Uh, the notion of game changer was mentioned. The Paris Agreement is the game changer of global climate agreement in the history. So this is really the breakthrough moment, and it's the genius of the Paris Agreement to have brought finance and climate together. And this is a combination that will work, and that will work very effectively. The G20 is behind us, and <coughs> it went perhaps a little bit better than worst fears. It was perhaps not the first best outcome, and there's a lot of talk about the G19 now. I would say that we can be a little bit more optimistic and can speak of a G19 and a half because there is a lot of support from the US business community on the issue of climate finance. There's a lot of support from the US at state level on this issue as well. And for the TCFD, our recommendations, which we have developed over a year and a half, we see a lot of adoption by US corporations. So even though the US federal government may not give its official support, the issue is already in the pipeline and is being adopted as we speak. So the recommendations, as you remember, were four simple areas asking firms to report on how they are organized on climate risk, how it impacts their strategy, how they manage the risk, and what the metrics are they're giving themselves. And this is now being adopted by corporations worldwide because it is good for business. It's not just good for the climate, but it's also good for business. It leads to better business decisions, better informed management decisions. I can tell you from personal experience, it changes the management conversation within the companies concerned. There is a much greater awareness by management about the climate-related issues. And this is why the TCFD is indeed an important milestone. Um, it is now out there. The recommendations are finalized and we see a lot of support from businesses, and again, not just through the G19, but actually through the G20 countries. Okay, and what are the next steps now that the final report is uh, published? So the group has agreed to stay around for one year and a half in order to oversee implementation, to an answer to possible questions, to possible do updates. So we'll be, be there and try to ensure the maximum implementation in the corporate world worldwide. We also continue to work with the treasuries and the central banks. And this is important too, because climate-related risks can represent a financial stability risk in the long term. So the regulators are very rightly focusing more and more on this issue. And then, of course, there are the regional and national initiatives. We will come to this in a moment, which is about transposition of the TCFD recommendations. And maybe later on we will say a word about what's happening in Europe. Philippe Zawati, of course, the Paris Financial Place is very much uh, implicated in this uh, initiative. And uh, it has recently launched the Finance for Tomorrow initiative on its own. Could you tell us um, the implication of, uh, of this uh, initiative for, uh, for the green finance? Yeah, <coughs> good morning to uh, everyone. Um, yes, I think the fact that we have this first round table here at the beginning of this uh, uh, event is a, a very strong signal, I think, and I uh, would we'll, uh, like to, to thank Paris Europlace, Europlace and Arnaud and, and Gérard Mestralet to, to decide this. Uh, um, we are at crossroads. Uh, everybody understands that uh, uh, finance is, uh, is key, that uh, it has a very important role to play, uh, but now we, are, we have to take really bold initiatives in order to move forward. We, uh, we need to understand that finance is not neutral, that finance is not only a mirror that we uh, put in front of uh, the real economy, but it has that, that finance is at the heart of the reallocation of capital that we, that we need. Uh, the Paris industry is uh, at the forefront of this. There are a lot of uh, 
players, a lot of commitments. I mean, we have here in Paris a very strong ecosystem with uh, players who are uh, really committed to integrate these environmental social impacts into their decision makings. And, uh, and so we uh, thought that it was very important to create, uh, um, a w I mean, a place where all these uh, actors of the industry could work together more to could innovate more. And this is the initiative that we have uh, taken last year with the Paris Green and F Sustainable Finance Initiative, which uh, became Finance for Tomorrow a couple of weeks ago. So uh, Finance for Tomorrow is uh, uh, an initiative where we have all the players in the industry, public and private players, because the relationship also between pu public and private is absolutely key. Public-private partnership is key, so we have banks, insurance companies, investors, asset management companies, consultants, and of course uh, the, uh, the the government with the uh, tra energy transition, uh, fair and energy transition minister and uh, and uh, and uh, the, the finance minister as well. But moreover, I think uh, it's we have to understand that it's not only about competition. Of course, it's a, it's a competition process between all the financial places, but it's not only a competition process. It's about competition, but more and more, it's about cooperation. Uh, and probably the important thing is that the winners will be the ones who cooperate the more. Uh, and this is the reason why we have welcomed uh, the uh, initiative taken by the G7 uh, and the uh, UNEP, to create a network of the financial centers. And this is something that we hope to launch in September or October between be before the COP uh, in order to gather all the financial centers. And we have, uh, I mean, there, are, there have been a lot of initiatives in the, in the last weeks in uh, London, Frankfurt, Luxembourg, Singapore, and others. And we need to create this in order to grow together. Uh, and we are very happy to uh, to have uh, the, the support of, of Ségolène Royal for Finance for Tomorrow and uh, to to help us to to create this uh, this uh, relationship between between uh, France and other uh, financial sy systems. Thank you. Le Florence Fontan, at the level of a group like uh, BNP Paribas, what does it mean to uh, to integrate those uh, challenges? Um, Say so as as. Uh, Ms. Royal has mentioned it uh, previously. I think BNP Paribas has been uh, uh, really invested in sustainability for, for a long time, and it ac actually accelerates since the COP21 in the Paris Agreement. Um, I think, of course, as uh, bankers, uh, our role is to accompany our clients in their journey, including on the climate and the ESG journey. Uh, so we have developed a number of products, uh, whether it's starting from social bonds, green bonds, I mean, ESG indexes, etc. But I think um, perhaps more importantly, it also starts from our own internal culture, because if you want to be credible vis-à-vis -vis our employees, vis-à-vis -vis our clients, you all need to start uh, by yourself and lead by example. And I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud that uh, we've been rated uh, number one in the uh, VGO uh, um, indexes, sustainable indexes, um, uh, on uh, last January on as part of the European banks. And just to give you an example, what does it mean? It means that concretely ESG factors are taken into our risk management decisions, uh, and that starts from the top at the COMEX level. It means that, for example, we've agreed to, we've committed to become carbon neutral as a company by the end of the year. Um, so it means also that, uh, as uh, Ms. Royal mentioned, we have taken bold decision not to finance some sectors, to uh, channel some, I mean, as you say, capital or financing into area that are uh, sustainable uh, favored. I would say. So these are examples, uh, and I think uh, in each company, I think it starts from, from the top, but also from the bottom to make sure that we take all our employees on board into this ESG and sustainability journey. And with that, we are also credible, and I'm in the uh, sustainable finance uh, element is a growing sector within our company as well. So it's a win-win relation. So le let's go uh, international and let's go to the U.S. <laughs> Marilyn Ceci, 
Uh, JP Morgan is one of the most important uh, green bonds uh, underwriter in the, in the world, but um, despite of its um, incredible growth in the last years, this market is still a niche market. So what could be done to make it grow uh, more rapidly? Um, thank you for that. Um, and thank you to Europlus for the kind invitation. Um, as we've all um, been, been anxiously watching this, the growth of the, of the green bond market, um, certainly the leadership that we've seen from, from the French government by issuing the green bond um, really does signal uh, to uh, the rest of uh, not only uh, companies and banks and so forth within France, but, but also globally. And so I think that leadership position is particularly important, and I do expect and hope that we'll continue to see that. I think with regard to the U.S., um, the elephant in the room, um, I think um, to some degree, um, you know, at J.P. Morgan, uh, our chairman has made it very clear, uh, uh, along with uh, many other, probably about 30 uh, U.S. and multinational corporations that it was our view and hope that we stayed in the Paris Agreement. And um, we've been very public on that uh, position, an advertisement in the Wall Street and so forth uh, in support of that. And so I think as you talk about the green bond market, um, I think it's important to recognize that um, you know, in the U.S., um, corporations will be quite clearly, and this uh, Christian mentioned this a little bit earlier, that um, we will continue to see, and I hope and expect that we'll continue to see both corporations as well as municipalities, water authorities, public transport, and so forth and so on, have been active in issuing green bonds, and I, I do expect that that will continue. You know, only days after um, uh, President Trump uh, made the announcement that he's withdrawing, Apple, of course, came in um, and, and issued their second green bond, a billion. And um, I think that we will expect to see corporates and municipalities issuing in order to demonstrate their commitment to the environment. And uh, internationally, how do you see the development of this market? For example, in India, you mentioned it. Uh, so we have seen um, quite a lot. Uh, of course, we all know what China has done last year. They represented 30%, a little over 30% of the green bond issuance. So, um, you know, congratulations to Ma Zhong and all his efforts there. Um, that's been, been quite impressive. Um, I think that, yes, we've continued to see what we would call the development of regional uh, guidance. So Brazil, uh, India, China, uh, Japan most recently has published their regional guidance encouraging the growth and the development of the green bond market um, in those regions. Okay. So now from the investors side now, <laughs> long-term investors are key to the development of uh, green finance. So Emma Howard Boyd, you're chair of the Environment Agency in the UK. Uh, could you explain us the strategy of the Environment um, Agency Patient Fund? Yes, and again, thanks for me for inviting me to join this panel today. I'm chair of the Environment Agency, but um, given that I've spent my career working in finance, I also chair the Investment Committee of the Environment Agency Pension Fund, which is responsible for looking after the savings, the pension savings of over 40,000 beneficiaries. And the Environment Agency in the UK is, is responsible for environmental regulation, but also all the work in England on flood defence. So our staff and former staff are right at the forefront of seeing how environmental sustainability works in action. And our liabilities stretch out um, into next century. So given that context, um, it's very easy for us as um, trustees of the Environment Agency Pension Fund to really think very seriously around our fiduciary duty and to understand that we would be in breach of our fiduciary duty if we were not embedding climate risk into the way we manage our fund. And we've been doing so for well over a decade. Ahead of the COP21 discussions, we um, 
announced a new strategy for our climate risk, embedding climate risk in the heart of our investment strategy. And uh, we got set about doing that and delivering financial performance because as trustees, that is absolutely key to the way we manage the fund by focusing on three different areas. Firstly, decarbonizing our portfolio. So this is about um, making sure that we understand how our portfolio is transitioning to a low carbon economy by investing in new companies, new companies that are developing renewable energy, the sorts of solutions that will help the world transition to a low carbon economy. And a, a final and very important theme, which is about engaging and collaboration. Our fund is just over three billion sterling, so um, it's tiny in comparison to the overall global market. So we understand that it is only by working with the fund managers who are global fund managers um, investing our portfolio, but also others that we are going to achieve what we're looking for in terms of long-term financial performance. And I'm, I'm delighted to say, as a public sector pension fund, our assets outweigh our liabilities, so we are a fully funded pension fund. And we've been able to demonstrate uh, long-term solid financial performance and we believe that is because of the way we have been managing our pension fund embedding these sorts of things into the way our strategy works so now uh, from a public and international um, institution perspective jeremy pelé uh, you you are um, uh, working for the agence française de développement um, could you tell us more about the um, the challenges behind the um, um, uh, best cooperation between uh, public and private sector, and uh, how can you push private banks to go green? Well, thank you, Annick. Um, actually, the, the development banks, both multilateral and, and bilateral, have been very active for, for developing uh, green finance over the last decade. Um, first, by channeling our own investments uh, into uh, project with a positive impact for, for climate. Um, the, the French Development Agency, Agence Française de Développement, has a target of investing 50% uh, of uh, its uh, total activities on projects with a co -benefit, uh, positive co-benefit for, for climate. Um, that's um, uh, that's a that's a very uh, high target. If you, I mean, the the target for the World Bank uh, is 28 percent by by 20, 2020. So we all have targets uh, to channel money on on climate uh, uh, finance. And as uh, Minister Royal mentioned earlier, uh, we'll we'll invest more than five billion euros per year by 2020 on uh, uh, on climate projects. Um, so that's the first uh, step to. Uh, to promote green finance. We, we, we've been also the first um, uh, French public uh, issuer to, to issue a green bond uh, more than uh, three years ago. Um, and I think to, um, now we need, we need to uh, probably to go a bit, a step forward. And our ambition is now to be fully compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, i.e. Uh, not only financing projects with a co-benefit uh, co uh, with a benefit for, for climate, but also making sure that all our investments are in line with the trajectories, national trajectories for the, for the Paris Agreement. So in that regard, uh, we've taken several steps together, uh, public and private uh, banks, uh, to develop um, to develop uh, the, the the climate finance, we've tried to uh, uh, make sure that we have common accounting standards uh, to measure what we call mitigation and what we call adaptation, especially through the the network of the International Development Finance Club, uh, and uh, we uh, we've also been favoring an uh, an initiative for mainstreaming. Um, the investments, uh, the green investments with all the banks, we've, we've pushed that during the, the, the COP21 uh, with 30 banks, uh, including BNP Paribas, 
uh, signing this. And today we have all the largest banks in the world uh, which uh, uh, have signed this, uh, these initiatives. And um, what we concretely do today to make sure that we channel the private money into uh, green finance in developing countries in developing is, is developing new tools uh, such as uh, guarantees, uh, such as uh, long-term uh, credit lines for local banks in developing countries with technical assistance to uh, make sure that uh, all the technology, all the capacity to assess the risks and the nature of green projects uh, are uh, well taken in the in the developing countries. Thank you, Emma. You wanted to um, to add something? Yes, I, I think this whole theme of collaboration, and I think um, amongst the group on the panel here today, we've all talked about um, the variety of different collaborative initiatives that we are involved with. And I think this is something that we're going to see more of. One of the things that um, the Environment Agency Pension Fund, alongside the Church Investors Group, launched earlier this year was an initiative called the Transition Pathway Initiative. And this is entirely complementary to the work of the task force um, that um, uh, we've talked about already. This is about, as groups of pension funds, and we now have four trillion um, sterling under management supporting this initiative, is to be able to assess how our portfolios are transitioning to a low carbon world. So again, this is a way that um, no matter where you are based as a pension fund, you need to cooperate with others globally, that we can begin to assess how our portfolios are living up to the sorts of ambitions that we set out by analyzing the underlying companies that sit within our portfolios. So, so today in, in London, there is another discussion taking place um, where the latest research that the Transition Pathway Initiative has launched in relation to the mining sector is being published. And again, this is a sort of um, initiative that we all know, whether we're from the US, um, the UK, elsewhere in Europe, um, Australia, that we need to, to work together in order to understand how the world is transitioning, both from a financial perspective, but from the underlying assets within our portfolio. Yes, so to, to, to work together, investors and, uh, and uh, banks and public institutions uh, need uh, to standardize uh, what is green, to define taxonomies. And um, I know that both uh, BNP Paribas and uh, JP Morgan are, are members of uh, one of the uh, most important initiatives, um, such as the Green Bond Principles and the Climate Bonds Initiative. So Marilyn Ceci, how do these two initiatives can help to, to define a standard and a taxonomy? Thank you for that. Um, yes, you're right. The Green Bond Principles uh, were uh, an initiative that were originally developed by four banks um, and has uh, grown quite substantially. I think we have over 250 members and observers now. The Climate Bonds Initiative is uh, a tremendous effort with Sean Kidney leading the effort that uh, everybody must know by now. He's everywhere. Um, that is actually by industry by industry trying to, in fact, define green. The Green Bond Principles do not, in fact, uh, define green. They are voluntary process guidelines for best practices. And we do offer high-level um, green categories. Um, and the Climate Bonds Initiative now has fully um, integrated with the Green Bond Principles now. So from a process standpoint, we're, we're fully aligned. Uh, one update I would say that we've made um, in the 2017 update of the Green Bond Principles was that we've now encouraged uh, the inclusion of any taxonomies, uh, LEED, BRIAM, or, or, or CBI for that matter, uh, that you've included in there. And I imagine that that will continue to expand over time and that will be encouraged. The definition of green is not that easy. I mean, the climate bonds has been added almost five years and they're not finished yet. And, um, and they have a lot of people working at it. So it's not that easy. I mean, what's green in, in the Netherlands, you know, may or may not be seen what's gr in green in China. And so personally, I do think that 
as that evolves over time, one size will not really fit all. And I think that we will likely adopt over time regional uh, guidance on what is green. And I think, as I was mentioning in my previous comment with regard to regional guidance, I think that's what's happening now to a large extent. I don't, uh, with the exception of China, who's actually defined green for them, uh, most of the others really are just providing guidance. But I think over time, that's how we will evolve. Ms. Filzawati, you, you want to, to make some precisions? Uh, yes, because uh, just to say I disagree, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we absolutely need to define what is green. This is something that we have uh, discussed a lot within the high level ex expert group uh, over the last uh, couple of months, and this is something that we will uh, probably uh, say, I mean, uh, very strongly in a in the report that uh, uh, we will issue uh, uh, and, uh, and present on uh, July the 18th in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, this is something that we have to do at the European level, uh, and, uh, and especially to discuss with China, because uh, the collaboration between Europe and China is very, is very important in, uh, in the context that we know uh, with the uh, withdrawal of the, uh, of the US of the Paris Agreement. And they have defined what they think what is green. Uh, we need to, to do the same, and uh, of course it's difficult. But it's feasible. I mean, we have an example with the uh, label, the French label, uh, which was launched uh, one year ago. Uh, we choose uh, at, the, at the basis of the, the CBI uh, taxonomy, but which clearly define what is green and what should be included in a, in, in a, green, in a green fund. So, uh, of course, it's difficult, but if we, uh, if we don't uh, uh, manage to do it, then the, the, the market will, will grow. Uh, but we don't grow uh, in, in uh, really in, in the way we would like it to, to grow. So. Okay, so Florence Fontan, you wanted to, um, to explain us um, the, the approach uh, of your group regarding uh, climate disclosure and reporting? Yeah, I think, I mean, as, uh, as mentioned earlier by, by Emma, um, there is a momentum for clearly institutional investors to invest into sustainability investments, um, but there's still a challenge to understand exactly what it means and how you manage the data aspect. So clearly the disclosure initiatives is, is, a, is a step forward to provide the initial data, but it's true that um, understanding this data, being able to play with it is still a very strong challenge. So we've been, I mean, Going back to collaboration, we've been discussing significantly with our various clients, and in particular the uh, pension funds across the globe. I mean, whether it's coming from Australia, UK, et cetera, and Netherlands. And, and this is still a challenge. So we've developed also for ourselves um, a, a tool, I mean, um, a data val visualization tools that integrating the various ESG factors, so environmental, social, and governance, um, it takes more than 750 data points per company, so it, it really explains and, and helps companies and, and investors to drill down to what exactly it means. So it, it's providing a simple data visualization tool, so you can have a, a massive um, analytics behind, but still it, it provides you a score. You can go easily to say what you want to invest into not. Um, another point of difficulty that we've seen is under understanding especially what a company is doing, especially when you're talking about the conglomerate. So uh, what is the business activities they are actually in? Uh, what is, uh, are they invested into controversial activities or controversial sectors, whether it's uh, um, human rights issues, uh, environmental issues, etc. And those indicators are not necessarily easy to identify, especially when you're talking about big groups that have multiple activities. So those simple tools is really, I think, essential to go forwards to facilitate institutional investors going to that. Um, as part of the uh, Article 173 of in France, I think there is more reporting and there's a carbon footprint, for example, elements that go with it. So similarly here, we, we're trying, I mean, we've just launched a, a partnership with Sicomo Asset Management um, to, uh, to develop, a, I mean, as a research element, we have to develop a, a score, an indicator for companies on their environmental impacts. Um, so we intend in the coming <coughs> weeks and months to, to test that indicators across uh, more than 1,000 companies 
to, to be able to, to, again, to provide elements, <coughs> not only for reporting purposes as uh, to be compliant for, for the French law, but also more to, for, for guidance in terms of investment and institutional investors facilitating. So going, going back to channeling <coughs> private sectors investment into the green finance or the, the, the sustainability investors, uh, I think it's understanding the data and facilitating those investment decisions is absolutely key. President Tiffany, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think we have talked a lot about uh, corporate initiatives and voluntary initiatives, and I think that's great. There's a lot going on, but uh, that will not be enough. Uh, the Paris Agreement is so ambitious. It means such an important reorientation on capital flows that we have to go further and look very much at the whole set of financial policy and financial regulation. So uh, the corporate initiatives are, are, are absolutely great. It's a good starting point, but now we have to go a step further. And in Europe, the European Commission has launched um, this process. It has asked itself, we see all these things that are happening. We see the Paris Agreement. What do we need to change in our regulation? And I mean really the hard wiring of financial regulation in order to bring the system towards sustainability. And this is uh, the group they have put together, and uh, Philippe is an eminent member of the group. And so the group has been working now for, for half a year, will come out with the first report next week, and is looking exactly at these questions. How do you integrate sustainability in financial regulations? And two, how do you mobilize more capital flows? And these are very difficult questions. Um, and to give you a flavor, the, the group is first of all looking what are the elements that we need to add? So there's a lot now on taxonomy and green bonds and disclosures and fiduciary duty. So this is the first step. But again, that will not be enough. If we really want to move the financial system, want to move the economy, we have to dramatically change the way the financial system is functioning. And this means two things. This means more long-term orientation of financial institutions, of banks, of insurance companies, of asset managers, of pension funds, and this means the systematic integration of the ESG factors into all financial decisions. And so we are also looking at whether there are roadblocks that would better be removed in order so that banks can do more long-term lending, so that insurance companies can do more long-term investing, more infrastructure investment. What can the European Union do to build the next step on the Juncker plan in order to have even more investment projects and so on. So this is a very, very large initiative that will start next week with the first recommendations on the issue of taxonomy and green bond standards. But they will then go on further in the second half of the year and look more at the structural changes that we need to make in the financial system and in the economy really to fulfill uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, Philippe and, uh, and Christian, uh, wh what will be the, the most um, important issues to, um, to, to reach an, uh, an agreement on, the, on this uh, intermediary report? <laughs> I think uh, Christian has <laughs> already answered. I mean, uh, uh, again, we have spoken a lot about, about collaboration, cooperation. But so it's about cooperation between the players, but also it's uh, about cooperation between the private sector and, uh, and the governments. Uh, uh, and what uh, uh, we have done uh, the last two years, uh, two, three years in France, I, th I think it's a good example. With uh, the way uh, the, uh, the industry, the financial industry, has worked with the government in order to, uh, to uh, improve the regulation uh, or to launch new regulation like Article 173, like the labels, like, of course, uh, the, uh, the issuing of the, uh, of the French uh, um, uh, green government bond. Uh, so we uh, we need this kind of regulation, uh, meaning a very flexible regulation, very business friendly regulation, uh, uh, with a, a strong uh, in depth analysis before the regulation and, uh, and collaboration with be be between the players and the industry, and uh, and hopefully we will see that it works. So we will have uh, 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 some. I mean, we'll have to to see. Uh, uh um, next year, uh, what, what, has, what are the uh, impact of these Article 173, for example? And uh, now we are going to, uh, to try to, uh, to, to push this kind of regulation at the, uh, at the European level. And then, um, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the way the public money is used is also very important. Uh, we need to use the public money uh, 
in a very efficient way. That means that we need the leverage to be as high as possible. We need the public money to, to be used in order to mobilize private money. Uh, so this is about guarantee, this is about uh, layered funds, this is about, uh, it's about innovation, but uh, everything which will help uh, the, the market to, um, to have a, a different assessment of the risk. Between the, one of the big questions is uh, the fact that a lot of investments are uh, possible, but the, the, the perception of the risk by uh, the, the, the financial, uh, by, by the investors uh, is not good. I mean, the, and we need to, to, to modify this perception of the risk, and the public money uh, is a very uh, I mean powerful tool in order to do that. Maybe just to add what is interesting about this group is that the Commission has asked the private sector and NGOs to develop proposals for regulation. This is very unique. So we have the insurance companies, the banks, we have the asset managers. So we are collectively thinking what changes would need to be made in regulation so as to allow us to help bring the economy towards sustainability. What changes? And one, I think one has to be mindful that integrating sustainability into financial regulation can't be done with one stroke of a pen. But of course, it also doesn't mean to rewrite the entire set of financial regulations. What it means is to find the places where there are obstacles and that need to be changed in order so that the banks can do more project lending and long-term lending that is so important for early infrastructure development, so that insurance companies can invest more in infrastructure assets so that pension funds can do the same and that the whole system takes into account sustainability issues as an integral part of financial decision making. And so the, I would say the European Commission has been very courageous to ask an independent expert group. It is even more generous by giving it its own support. So we have a secretariat of the European Commission by DG FISMA. So that's the financial regulator that is helping us and helping us to be sure that our considerations are in line with the overall framework of regulation. So I think it's a very, very interesting process that the European Union has established here. And um, we are very open. We will publish the report. There will be consultation. So everybody can provide input and help us find the right path in the second half of the year towards the final report that is then due in December this year. Meanwhile, whilst this important work is taking place, real action is also taking place at significant scale. So I'm thinking of um, HSBC's UK pension fund making um, the default fund for its pension fund being a future world, a carbon, low carbon tilted um, index um, fund. We've also seen significant moves coming from the Japan government um, investment a pension fund, uh, again looking at indices and saying the default index needs to integrate um, environmental, social and governance factors. So whilst I think it's absolutely key that we look at the regulation, I think what's also been really encouraging is the leadership that is being shown um, around the world in terms of taking significant steps towards reallocating capital. And that to me um, goes back to the point that there's not just one thing that will um, sort this issue out. It's about a whole series of different initiatives with people taking, um, uh, holding up the mirror and also looking at um, the things that they can do themselves on behalf, and I come back to um, the way we look at it with our pension fund, this is on behalf of our beneficiaries, the people um, who have um, given, entrusted with us their hard-earned long-term savings, and we need to make sure that we're looking after them, those savings, looking after them from a financial perspective, but for the world in which they're going to be retiring. Yeah, I think that what, what Philippe said earlier is really important. Um, there is a real appetite from, from the investors, the international investors, for, for green finance today. And I think we, we've made huge, huge steps in terms of, of standardization, the green bond principles, etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's, it's very good. What's, what's probably lacking in what we see uh, in developing countries, but that's, that's valuable elsewhere, is uh, the lack of uh, bankable projects. Uh, um, and that's probably here where we need to push uh, a bit uh, a bit further. Well, well, in France, we now have a, a clear uh, strategy announced by Nicolas Hulot uh, last week uh, for, for our 
a plan. And the, the we need a, a strong political uh, driver in all the countries to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, you'll get new projects to, to be financed by, by all this uh, money that wants to, to, to be invested into uh, uh, into uh, climate uh, climate uh, projects. So I think for us it's really important to stay focused on very concrete initiatives to, to make sure that we have new project emerging such as uh, the, 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 the African uh, uh, initiative uh, for renewable energy such as uh, uh, the, 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 the solar uh, alliance led by India and, uh, and to develop projects such as the, the, the equity fund we are we're building with the French uh, Caisse des Depots um, to invest in infrastructure projects uh, in developing countries, especially on, um, uh, on green, uh, green projects. And, 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 and make sure making sure that some, some initiatives, in innovative initiatives such as uh, off-grid in Africa or, or other uh, uh, new, new, new initiatives will, um, will, uh, will be more uh, mainstream and develop uh, in, in, in developing countries but also in, uh, in, in the Western countries. So you, you mentioned the climate plan um, announced by Nicola Hulot uh, last week. What does it imply for you, uh, French uh, bankers and investors, to, um, to, to become uh, carbon neutral by uh, 2050? BNP Paribas <laughs> is quite immediate, but uh, to <coughs> the, the global effort uh, will be huge to, uh, to, to, be, um, to be on time. Yes. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, I it's first a, a decision to take. Um, it's an investment attached to that. So, uh, uh, and again, behind it's a, it's a cultural change. I mean, uh, becoming carbon neutral means also, I mean, just as a simple element, um, to be more responsible in terms of travel policy, to facilitate video conferences, uh, also for our internal meetings, for example. I think uh, the, the carbon neutral uh, concept is, uh, is both, I would say, some simple step that each and everyone needs to take, uh, and also, uh, I would say, a global decision at, at the bank level, at the group level. Someone want to uh, to intervene <laughs> on, the, on the matter. <laughs> so to finish, I wanted to uh, to ask you your um, your your um, analysis post G20. Uh, do you feel that the the political uh, support is um, is sufficient to uh, to help the development of uh, the green finance markets? Who wants to to give its views first? If you want me to start, so I think for Europe the answer is definitely yes. The support is sufficient, it's very strong. And at the global level, I think it's very important also to see leadership in markets such as China and many other emerging countries. And as far as the United States is, um, is concerned, and we have JP Morgan here and many other leading corporations, I think we can rely on corporate leadership and at leadership at state level, which is also very, very relevant. So I think there's a lot of positive momentum overall and um, with, if it all goes well, it will be a positive decision for the economy. It will make the economy stronger, more resilient, make the financial system more resilient as well. And therefore, I think it's a very, very positive momentum that's currently going on. Marini? <laughs> um, yeah, I agree uh, completely um, with what Christian has said. You know, we. Um, I just want to get back to the, the voluntary versus um, regulated market. I think that, um, you know, the initiative that we started with the Green Barn Principles um, was voluntary in nature. And while we talk about, Philippe, the, the, the difficulties with, in fact, defining green, um, we've had a green definition out with CBI. It's still 75% of the issuers still prefer to define green for themselves. And while there is a tremendous amount of overlap, w without a doubt, one of the concerns that we have to be mindful of is 
that um, we don't want to crush the growing development that we have in the market. So if we create a very strict definition of green too early on in the evolution of the market, we run the risk that corporate issuers will pull back. A and that's, that's sort of my challenge as, as we think about it. But, you know, we continue to see, you know, tremendous growth in that, in, in that green market, and, and I do expect to see that uh, further growth without a doubt. Yeah, may, may, maybe what, what has changed dramatically is the, is the, is the global awareness on, on climate. And this, this is this awareness that pushes investors, shareholders to be uh, more ambitious uh, in terms of, of climate. And I, I think this, this pressure uh, definitely changes everything uh, and, and, and pushes all the, all the governments uh, to, to uh, even uh, those who are less uh, keen on uh, uh, following the, the, the Paris Agreement to uh, actually uh, uh, to, 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 to go into uh, the, the right direction. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers of this first session. Thank you, Mrs. Minister, Mrs. Ségolène Royal, for having make, uh, made the introduction. We have uh, been very impressed by your very strong message uh, on the necessity that the economy, the global economy and the, glo and the financial sector on the global level are taking into account these challenges of the environment, of uh, the fight against uh, the, 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 the climate and uh, to accelerate, that we all have to accelerate uh, our initiatives in that field. And uh, you have to know that the financial sector is very mobilized. And thank you to all the speakers of this session. Thank you to Philippe Z Zawati who uh, chairs uh, our initiative, uh, Sustainable Finance. So I'm asking now the participants of the second session dedicated to uh, European Roadmap.